culture. The NFL playoffs are finally upon us. And with DraftKings Sportsbook, the sponsor of this video, they're giving new players an offer they can't refuse. In the quest to the big game, DraftKings is offering 56 to 1 odds for new customers. Bet $5 and win $280 in free bets if your team wins in the wildcard round. This is big news if you're in New York. Since a little birdie has told me that sports betting has finally been legalized up there, hint, hint. But even if your state doesn't offer DraftKings Sportsbook yet, there is still plenty to play for. DraftKings offers daily fantasy football contests available to anyone in the United States. The opportunity to win millions in cash prizes is yours for the taking with your first deposit. And all you have to do is reach out for it. The play call is simple. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code UTREE and get 56 to 1 odds on any NFL team. Bet just $5 and win $280 in free bets if your team wins. That's promo code UTREE at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. And as always, remember to gamble safely and responsibly. Now on to the show. I don't blame you for not paying attention to this fact, but the regular season isn't over just yet. Week 18 is yet to decide the fate of more than a few teams. Let's get the less important games out of the way first and foremost. Ain't this the story of two opposite franchises or what? One gets all the damn breaks in the world and the other only gets broken dreams. The Broncos have nothing to play for but continued frustrations. It's pretty much been their damn season. Outstanding defense held underwater to drown by the chains of offensive ineptitude. Kansas City was right where they wanted them too. The Chiefs had been dominating time of possession, but time and time again Denver's defense would quash them. Somehow, I know, it's shocking to say, their offense was scoring points. They were moving down the field in the fourth quarter. Seven minutes off the clock. Their running game has been impeccable. Before they nearly shock the world, a blitzer blows up a play before it starts. The ball miraculously lands in the Chiefs defender's hands, and he runs it back almost 90 yards for a touchdown. All but ripped the wind in their arms from their stiff, decaying body. If that isn't Denver's season in one play, I don't know what the fuck is. I'll give an honorable mention to kicking a field goal down by seven in the fourth, but this is now the Chiefs' 13th straight win against Denver. Perhaps if the Broncos' D wasn't paid to drop every potential interception of Mahomes, maybe things might have been different. You can't really gauge this game for anything of note since Philly was wrecked by Corona Jan and injury. Most of their good starters were out for this match. You know what? That's honestly for the best. They already have a wildcard spot wrapped up. Get the COVID wave out of the way before the postseason. Better here than that. Dallas would have been tough in normal circumstances, but in these? You might as well have kissed any hopes goodbye. No amount of Minshew magic could save them against the Cowboys. They barely broke a sweat. It was pretty much a tune-up game for them in a postseason where they desperately need to show up. There have been many uncomfortable flaws poking out of their supposedly perfect exterior. You can't shit on them here since they did what they had to do, but there will be many asking what their upside will be and there will continue to be until they prove them all wrong. That's all I can say here. Dallas, take the free score, Agami, and go. The Giants fucking suck. They suck even more since they're not only forced to start Jake from State Farm due to injuries. New York is allowing Dave Gettleman to retire with dignity. The dude who has done nothing but fuck up since he's been brought back into the fold. But it's okay, everyone. They're a family. They can get smashed to bits by a decrepit Washington franchise, but at least nobody's feelings were hurt. The football team may have fallen into a pit of despair and real life shit, but they get somewhat of a decent cap off to a season that was as broken as FedEx Field. Yes, New York is a terribly run franchise that somehow makes the Jets look competent, but we should consider the positives of such shittiness. Where would we be without the Giants running a quarterback sneak on a third and nine near their own end zone? Somewhere without fantastic memes, I'll tell you that. God, this team sucks so much ass you could call it Liberace. Both of these coaches are getting fired at the end of this game, so who fucking cares? Andy Dalton versus Kirk Cousins in another pure shit show of fantastic proportions. The epitome of wasted seasons thrown in front of you for observation and eventual death. In the typical Minnesota Vikings style, they don't do a damn thing until it's far too late to change anything. This week is the same situation. 
they're relatively neck and neck with the Bears, which isn't shocking since neither have anything to play for. But Andy Dalton's red rifle fires a blank to Pat Pete who returns it for a touchdown. That momentum allows the Vikings to win nothing but emptiness in a worse draft position. Well done, Minnesota. You pissed away golden opportunities left and right. This is what you get for thinking the same shit that failed in years past was going to work over and over again. I'm getting too worked up over this. Let's throw both these teams into the pit and call it a day. We expected this game to be lopsided at the beginning of the year. Just not in polar opposite directions. The Bengals have already clinched their top prize, so they're resting Joe Burrow. However, Joe Mixon is out thanks to COVID protocol. Cleveland is in a much better spot today. They finally chucked Baker Mayfield in his imitation as a saboteur into a surgery unit to repair his fucked up shoulder. Kansas City winning fucked up since he's minuscule chances for the number one seed, so not much to play for on their end. Besides a shitload of punting in the first half, the Browns had a bit of a lead headed into halftime. Excluding more self-sabotage from a fumble recovery for a touchdown. Including that faux pas, Cleveland adds more misery to the pile by winning a game when it's no longer necessary to do so. Which is far from surprising to anyone who follows them. A lost season in what was supposed to be the start of something great. It's somehow on brand for this franchise. The only positive on the day is a good send-off to Doug Deacon's retirement after decades of service to the Browns. Rest easy, soldier. You went out a winner. To be honest, the first overall pick doesn't matter for the Lions. There isn't a clear-cut top draft choice, and they'll get an elite edge rusher with the second pick if they desire one. Green Bay has nothing to play for, so Aaron Rodgers is going to be taken out of the game at halftime for Jordan Love. Don't tell that to Detroit, however. They're going to pull out every damn trick in the book for a win. Once again, it's not about the tank for them. It's about pride. It's about one-upping the older brother that has tormented them for decades. In odd fashion, the matchup has become an offensive shootout in the second half. Are we back to 2018, Jared Goff? Because he's returned to a surprisingly good form in this final match. In response, Jordan Love throws a long touchdown to Josiah DeGuara to give Green Bay the lead in the hopes of good tidings for the potential of life without Aaron Rodgers next season. However, Detroit will have the last laugh. Jared Goff will be the man that will lead the relentless fight. Jordan Love? He forces interceptions to give the Lions a sweet end cap to a rebuilding year. I've said it before and I'll say it again. This is the best season Detroit has had in years. And even though this win may be meaningless, it's huge for their morale. As a result, it doesn't matter if they win or lose, Jacksonville has successfully defended their tank ball title. Well done, lads. Kayvon Thibodeau, or whatever you want to do with the first pick, is once again yours. Unfortunately for Carolina, I do not have good news to share with you this week. First of all, Matt Rule will be staying put as head coach, thus continuing his self-made comparisons to Jay-Z for another year. Thank you, enormous fucking contract. Secondly, Tampa Bay still has positioning to play for, so you'll be receiving no sort of mercy whatsoever. Sam Darnold, if you're lucky, will be making his last career start for the Panthers after this debacle of a season. You know, I really thought he could turn it around after being out nope. and with the Jets. It unfortunately was not the case due to a litany of self-inflicted errors. Plus the fact that the Buccaneers are pretty damn good and need to win for playoff seating. Tom Brady solidifies his claim to being an immortal deity by leading the goddamn NFL in passing yards and touchdowns. I sense jealousies brewing. I expect Carolina to get really desperate and throw everything for Deshaun Watson or something. It's the only way they can justify Matt Rule's contract. Although it's not like Tampa has their own troubles brewing. If Antonio Brown's mission was to burn every goddamn bridge he's ever come across and ruin his career, then it's been accomplished. His self-destruction is a generational talent, and the petty Enzer in me is merely saying, I fucking told you so. He was officially cut from the Bucks on Thursday, and ever since then he's been going scorched earth. I'm not saying Tampa Bay is completely innocent here, there are instances where a team completely fucks over a player that's injured, but this doesn't feel like it's it. Riddle me this, Batman. If an ankle injury is so severe, why the hell are you making these incredible cuts on the field? Why aren't you telling anyone on the training staff about it? The organization set up appointments with New York-based doctors so you wouldn't only get the surgery you needed, but get paid what you were owed. Knowing AB, this isn't about the ankle, but it's about not getting the ball enough. Big shock, that's what it probably was about. It was the final straw for Arians. And they told him to fuck off from the field. Now we know that part wasn't Antonio, but the rest of it was him. Even violating COVID protocol by fucking a chick who licked toilets and telling her to, quote, watch what I do tomorrow. What I don't get is him shitting all over the Bucks organization and Tom Brady in interviews. Dude thought this text convo put Brady's trainer Alex Guerrero in a bad light. 
and AB ended up posting his bank account information on accident. Bitch, are you for real? You became such cancer that nobody wanted to touch you after what you did in Oakland. Tom Brady was the only reason you got this gig in the first place. And he's out here bitching about not being paid enough? Are you really this dense, man? What happened to the over $30 million guaranteed from the Raiders you pissed away? How about the million in bonuses you just sabotaged? You're incinerating dollars while whining about pennies. Fucking goddamn idiot's about to make himself bankrupt in five years. For what? Petty retribution? Blatant narcissism? Something more morbid? I hate talking about this shit. In this final week, the Patriots must traverse deep into the jungles for a chance at a home playoff game. They journey to a horrible land they call... Miami. It's a place that has been kryptonite for New England. No matter what they do, they always seem to lose down there. Lo and behold, the Patriots struggle to maintain any sort of form and are cannibalized by local tribesmen. I feel like I'm merely replaying old seasons, since they were quite sloppy against the Dolphins. Stop me if you've heard that one before. Miami gets out to a convincing lead early and never lets it go. Despite a rough start that'll have them kicking, the Dolphins finish strong by winning 8 of 9. I have a question. Will the real New England please stand up? They've had some serious struggles against teams not named Jacksonville these past few weeks. And this loss merely reinforces those narratives. They have a rematch of destiny back in Buffalo. And they better hope that the winds are gusting up to 50 miles per hour again. For Bill's sake. Do you like punting, folks? This game had all of that and more in spades. I'd personally argue this is an alarming revelation for the Bills since they can't do anything against the Jets. And how banged up they've been on defense all year? I guess you could say that at least they ended up winning in the end? Even then, it took way too long for them to get to full speed. When they eventually did, all was fine, but this isn't a good look against the red-headed stepchild of the division. As advertised earlier, all that was involved for most of the contest was endless punting. Punting as far as the eye could see. Making things very uneasy for Bill's Mafia. Fortunately, Josh Allen carried the team on his back again, so they avoid humiliation. And successfully secure the AFC East for the second consecutive year. Before continued success, all you can hope is that their defense is as otherworldly as it was today. You can't hold every single team to five net yards passing. Not every QB you face will be Zach Wilson. The only thing the Cardinals have to fight for is the slightest of chances to win the NFC West in a home playoff game. It was in front of them, but even then, they couldn't do it. Seattle had little to play for besides bragging rights, but they came out here duking like they were back in their heyday. Russ Wilson cooking up touchdowns and long passes to his receivers all game. They were able to keep pace with Arizona's high-flying offense for the most part. And Rashad Penny? What can you say about him? He's gone from a guy about to be cast off in free agency to a potentially vital part of this franchise in the matter of a month. 190 yards on the day. Helping the Seahawks to make the Jets' first rounder that much worse. It's still in the top 10, but their year ends on a high note with a winning streak. Plus, Pete Carroll should be back. I'll leave that up to you if that's good or not. But what about the Cardinals? Their loss means the Rams automatically win the NFC West. It's another weekend to a season which has been a hallmark of Cliff Kingsbury's teams. What the hell happened to that defense? Seattle's receivers were open all game long. If they're not careful, they're an easy one and done. Consider this your final warning, boys. The rest of the games have significant playoff implications from this point forward. To begin, we head to Houston for a big matchup against Tennessee. If the Titans win here against this allegedly easy opponent, they will have successfully clinched the number one seed in the AFC. It's really hard to think considering how injured to hell and back they've been this year. The rewards for winning will be great. A bye week and much needed rest for the potential return of King Henry. This is as must win as it gets at this point. Even for all of Houston's troubles in this lost season, they are still going to fight with everything they've got. Once again, like Detroit and the Jets, it's about pride. There are rumors that the poor Patsy named David Culley will be a one and done, and the Texans will want to win one if this is his last game. The Titans get out to a quick lead early, but be careful! Houston, the object in your rearview mirror is closer than they appear. General Mills is leading drives against their defense as part of this complete breakfast. No matter what Tennessee and Ryan Tannehill do, they cannot escape the pursuit of their former homeland in Houston. As Davis Mills looks like a bona fide starter in this league, Gainuses throughout Nashville will be clenched as they're only up by three with four minutes left. However, in a shocking turn of events, 
the Titans offense clamps on for dear life to end the game. A perilous fate has been averted. The Tennessee Titans have claimed the number one seed. Really? The Titans claimed it? Man, the AFC is really fucked this year. Before the hell of AFC wildcard action, let's move over to the NFC's final spot, where the Niners have a chance to seal their fate with a win. San Francisco may have won their last five appearances against the Rams, but early on, not looking so hot. The Niners are struggling immensely, oh, no. as LA knows the stakes of what is to come. But here is what separates the true contenders from fool's gold. Can they finish off their opponents when they are down? Matthew Stafford has had trouble doing this in games that have mattered, and once again LA is failing to do so. Thanks to shitty quarterback play and some timely defense from the 49ers, San Francisco has matched the Rams 17 points with the awesome might of Debo Samuel. Who needs Jimmy Jesus in his fucked hand when Debo can throw dimes like this to receivers? Perhaps he should keep trying to as Garoppolo throws a duck near the red zone thanks to a fantastic interception by Jalen Ramsey. This is when Matthew Stafford remembers that he was brought in to win under penalty of death. So he manages to play up to his ability and lead a touchdown drive to regain the lead. Deep in the fourth, times are getting tense for the Niners. But to truly grasp it, we need to see how the Saints are doing. I'm calling both games! Think this could be Matt Ryan's final game as a Falcon. All I can think is that he should have a ring, if not for Kyle Shanahan's arrogance and a choke for the ages. What a way to honor his legacy in Atlanta than with another painful reminder that the Falcons are doomed to failure. Let us consider the following. Taysom Hill was forced out of this game early due to a list Frank injury. Poor Bastard might lose his scrambling ability as a result. And poor Bastards in attendance will have to suffer through Trevor Simeon. In a testament to their futility, he dominates against what's left of the Falcons' defense at this point. It's not much of a contest. The Saints do what they need to do and stay alive thanks to picking apart their rival with divine intervention. But even then, they cannot control their own destiny. They must wait for the Rams to do their part. And finish the job. It's panicking season, San Francisco. If they lose, they're out of the dance. So what they're going to need is either Jimmy Jesus to reincarnate his golden abilities or the Rams defense to collapse in coverage. The good news is that they ended up getting both. Thanks to nobody bothering to tackle Debo or cover Juwan Jennings has us in a stalemate. The Niners have come back to bring this to overtime. San Francisco gets the ball first. They know the stakes of what is to come. They will give it everything they've got on this drive to save their lives. San Fran gets all the way to the red zone, but can't convert in the end. They'll be forced to give the ball back to the Rams with a field goal. However, they burned a lot of clock on the drive. LA and Stafford will have to work quickly to salvage the game. Watch Stafford go deep and picked off. Intercepted by Embry Thomas. Rams, welcome to the Detroit Stafford that can't do shit when he's needed to carry a team. Sadly, he is not playing the Ravens practice squad secondary. The Niners have been iffy, but they could make some noise in the playoffs if the cards fall right. Thus leaves the Saints on the outside looking in. I can't fault New Orleans for the season they've had, injuries decimated them on offense. The fact that we're even in this race for this long is a damn good coaching job for what it's worth. I'm proud of them in a way. I don't want to do this, but rules are rules. And death cares not for hardship. New Orleans Saints eliminated. The final spots in the AFC still need to be decided as well. Pittsburgh and Baltimore are two absolutely terrible teams who shouldn't be anywhere near the playoffs. It's as ugly on the field as the rain pelting both teams today. It's painful to watch in any interpretation of the word. It's AFC North football. Steelers and Ravens taking the field with significant flaws on both sides. Pittsburgh has a trash offense and is getting bailed out by fluke wins and endless bullshit. Baltimore's problem is simple. They're the unanimous winners of this season's injury bowl. Very well earned indeed. The main differences in this game are easy to identify. The Ravens are making critical errors due to their legions of backups and practice squad players. The Steelers are simply a tortoise. Going slow and steady hoping for the other team to fuck up. TJ Watt can tie the sack record but that's all there's going to be so far. Baltimore may have the lead, but the high-end talent and incredible bullshit powers of Pittsburgh will save them from the horrors of an 8-8-1 Super Bowl. Both teams are trying their hardest to win, but don't have anywhere near the ability to do so. Justin Tucker is one of the few Ravens players left who are any good, so we will head to overtime. But they both need something to happen for Hope to stay alive. They need to look to Jacksonville. 
God help us all. I'm calling both games! Indy. What the actual fuck was that? In a game that was being handed to them as an easy win, the Colts undertook one of the most spectacular chokes the NFL has seen in its history. It's one thing if it's a close game, you know, the whole any given Sunday motif, and he hadn't won there since 2014, and Jacksonville has nothing to lose. But this wasn't even that. This was a colossal failure on all fronts. The defense defended against Trevor Lawrence as well as a parking cone against a car. Offensive play calling was awful. Jonathan Taylor could do nothing as we meet the real failure of the game. This performance will near single-handedly run Carson Wentz out of town. All he had to do was not fuck up and he shit his pants so often he needed huggies. If you exclude his garbage time touchdown drive, Carson Wentz went 8 for 20 for 100 yards passing, a pick, a fumble, and a quarterback rating of 35. Need I remind you, this is against the worst team in football this season. Their fans came dressed as fucking clowns due to how terribly run they are and they still got blown out of the goddamn water. Indy prolapsed when it mattered the most. And I'd strongly consider firing everyone if I'm in charge. These kinds of losses are hard to recover from. This is completely unacceptable from a so-called playoff contender. Ballard and Reich tethered their boats to the ship of Wentz in the offseason. And if he sinks, he might take them down with him. They are easy candidates for low cow of the week, especially when given the circumstances. I knew something was off about these fuckers in the middle of the year. And their failures were revealed at the worst possible time. You deserve to be a meme, Colts. Embrace it. Get the fuck out of my sight and take your broken quarterback with you. If you get the opportunity, you should kill yourself. Now we have something to play for here. Baltimore gets the ball in OT first, but they can do little against Steeler bullshit. Big Ben has nothing left in his body, but they're gonna carry this old bastard to another playoff run if he wants it or not. The Black and Gold Brigade is converting third downs because the Ravens are literally out of cornerbacks. But even then, it's not enough. They go bold on fourth down and save Ben from a badly underthrown ball thanks to Ray Ray McLeod. Thus setting up a chip shot to win the game and keep their false hopes alive. Marvin will hold it, sweeps the leg, and that is a winner for Pittsburgh! Steelers fucking suck. They barely scraped by against Baltimore's XFL affiliate. I'd be ashamed, but they managed to find ways to live. Despite the fact that they should have been dead weeks ago. Indianapolis, you failed miserably. And if Baltimore's going to hell, they're taking you with them. Yeah! Baltimore Ravens and Indianapolis Colts eliminated. We have one more contest to settle. Raiders and Chargers in a grudge match for all the marbles. The rules are simple. Win and survive, lose and fall to an early demise. Tie, and they both make it in. Many were hoping for them both to punt the game away and need the clock out, but this is a rivalry match. If you had the chance to take out your hated foe, you're going to fucking do it, don't you know? Reinforcing narratives, the Chargers are doing a good enough job of that on their own. Bruh. What's more San Diego than muffed punts and backbreaking penalties to keep the Raiders in the damn contest? Yes, I said San Diego, that's where they should still be. And it's why their old curse is continuing to haunt them in mysterious ways. I get this pass interference is on an uncatchable ball, but it was blatant P.I. Rough ball aside, how in God's name do you explain some of the brain-dead decisions made by Brandon Staley? Going for it on a fourth and one at your own 20? Down by three with one of the most conservative play calls known to man? You're lucky the Raiders only got three points out of it, but Staley's almost dogmatic with analytics. And you can't do that. Vegas will continue to move further and further away from the Chargers because they're masters at autoerotic asphyxiation. Real talk, boys, get help for that shit. One slip up and you're pushing daisies with that kind of fetish. I don't get it either, but the Raiders are now up by 15 and time is running short. Fortunately for LA, they have some high-end talent of their own. Here I come to save the day. Justin Herbert, the savior of LA's assured self-destruction. This game has gone from intense, to absurd, to fucking scripted. The Chargers are converting third and fourth downs at will. Even the ones that should be fucking impossible. Such as a fourth and goddamn 21 at the Raider 23 for a touchdown. Wait for it, let me guess the next move. They stop the Raiders on a drive and get the chance to have the ball back to tie. 
I'm dead serious. If it's revealed that this entire season was engineered by the NFL to maximize fan interest and boost ratings, I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest. This entire year feels like the most outrageous goddamn movie come to life, with the miraculous comebacks and everything. Right on cue, Justin Herbert has a chance to tie the game with a touchdown. Herbert. Finally. Holy shit. Caught in the end zone by the big body, Mike Williams. Are you exhausted enough to not last through another overtime? The NFL doesn't give a shit. We're going to get more goddamn torture and you'll love it. The Raiders get the ball first and push down the field, but fail. Which means a field goal for Daniel Carlson, giving a nice peck on the cheek to the goalpost for good measure. LA returns the favor with another clutch fourth down conversion, because the scriptwriters haven't given this game enough fucking twists. However, they are stuffed and forced to kick a field goal to tie again. Now the Raiders get a chance to hold serve, and have a chance to simply run the clock out to tie so they both make it in. It feels like they're doing so with safe runs up the gut with Josh Jacobs. Yet, for some inane reason, Brandon Staley calls a timeout. The Raiders know the golden rule. Never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. And Staley is making a massive one. His reasoning is that he wanted to change up his formation and stop the most obvious running play in the world. What he didn't account for are two things. First is that Vegas would change up their formation and running play, thus exposing the Chargers' god-awful run defense. Secondly, both Derek Carr and Rich Bisaccia hinted that they were content with running the clock out. The timeout changed their plans. If Staley had done nothing, there was a chance this would have ended in a tie. He played himself by overthinking the situation. Again. This kind of horrible coaching job is honestly fireable. They shouldn't do it since he's in his first year, but his fuck-ups have assured the Chargers' destruction. Much to the joy of the Pittsburghers about to die at the sight of this shit. Is that good? Oh, good. And... Raiders in. Chargers out. Steelers in. I'm honestly speechless. A team that was looking like an outright Super Bowl contender at the beginning of the year sabotaged themselves to lose to the fucking Raiders. Worst of all, they can blame no one but themselves. As I've said before, you can take the Chargers out of San Diego, but you can't take the San Diego out of the Chargers. 2021 will be remembered as another one of those horrifying years in their history. When we're old and gray, we'll look back on this team and think... How the fuck did they miss the playoffs? <laughs> Los Angeles Chargers eliminated. Fuck you, Spanos. In conclusion, the AFC embraces the gods of chaos. The almighty coin has corrected its past mistake and fulfilled destiny. The Raiders and Steelers, two teams that shouldn't be anywhere near the dance, have made it thanks to separate deals with the devil himself. Just watch these two teams play each other in the AFC Championship. It'd be fitting for how fucked this year has been. This has been a season. So many twists and turns that it's hard to conceive with the naked eye. If you were looking at this year seriously, it was absolutely exhausting. But do you know the true bounty to cherish? The memes. It was fucking gold for this economy. Thanks to incredible collapses, fantastic comebacks, Urban Meyer's coaching tenure, and whatever the fuck Antonio Brown did in the Jets game. If the bigger games are going to be as fucked as the regular season is, I expect plenty of shenanigans to come in the future. Get ready. The NFL playoffs are about to begin. And the haters guide along with it. I'll see you then. The river of blood is hungry for moisture. May Black Monday satisfy its urges for a short while. I thought this guy was going to be good. Guess that goes to show how little I know a coach will do with the transition from coordinator. Fangio was as stereotypical as can be. The defensive guru who failed to adapt to anything resembling a modern offense. You can say he never had a quarterback when he was here, but how do you explain his team's pension for throwing checkdowns and short out routes on third and long? When you trust guys like Pat Shermer to run your offense, only bad things can happen. And this is why Fangio got the axe as a coach. He'll be in high demand as a defensive coordinator in the offseason. The team that gets him is getting a damn good one. And it's a place he'll be much more comfortable being in. Mike Zimmer is the best coach the Vikings have had since Bud Grant. Mike Zimmer is the main reason why the Vikings have been held back as a franchise the past few seasons. Both of these statements can be correct. It's an inevitability of any coaching tenure in any sport. Zimmer was past his expiration date. 
It happens to a lot of good coaches, and I'll be far from the last to suffer such a fate. Like most tough love coaches, Zimmer's tactics wore thin. He developed what some players call a culture of fear, which never has lasting power in the NFL. Perhaps that culture of fear could be how he was chicken shit with his offensive weapons most of the time. Football is a cold business. About as cold as Zimmer was with the press, unvaccinated coaches, and rookie players. A defensive coordinator job is his if he wants it. But considering his age and the stuff he's been through, this might be it for him. Time will tell if he still wants to keep coaching. It was a good run if he hangs them up. Minnesota's finally admitting that endless futility isn't working and is blowing up their executive branch. That's good and all, but it's too late to change anything. Spielman had some flashes of brilliance in his tenure, but all that'll be remembered is what he did for the team in his later years. His drafting was god-awful. Sure, he picked Justin Jefferson and a few other guys, but what else was there? Look at his 2020 class and be shocked at how barren it was for all the picks they had. As time passes, the main legacy he's going to hold is a quarterback. His outcome was tied to his all-in move of signing Kirk Cousins. Since then, they've missed the playoffs three out of four years. It hasn't worked. It's not all Cousins' fault, but a lot of it lies at the feet of Spielman and his moves. And the Vikings will be picking up the pieces for a good bit. The double doink broke him. You know how some teams can't recover from devastating losses? It's apparently the same for coaches. Once that game happened, Nagy went from a coach of the year candidate to a man riding coach on the meme plane. For a certified offensive genius of 2017, Nagy sure as hell had a hard time of moving the ball forwards in his time in Chicago. Excluding his rookie campaign, his teams were incredibly mediocre. And there's a good reason for it. He never had solid offensive game plans. Especially when he was the one calling the shots there. There's a reason why Bears fans jumped for joy when Bill Lazor started calling plays. The league is littered with so-called gurus that fall flat on their face when they move up the ranks. Nagy is another to the pile. He'll probably move back in with Andy Reid if Biennemi gets a chance somewhere else. He'll be okay. This man has his defenders. That's the most hilarious part to me. Do you know what I see? A bad GM responsible for some of the worst moves in recent history. This man paid Mike Clennon $18.5 million guaranteed. A month later, he panicked in a trade to move up one spot to draft a bust in Mitch Trubisky. A move that was fucking terrible from the start. He did bring in Khalil Mack for a premium. But for that kind of move, there was endless neglect of the offensive line. A lack of proper development for the quarterbacks he threw everything at. A lack of a true plan to move the team forward. He brought in sexy names for the defense, but it just seems like he was adding. There was nothing done to solidify the heart of the team. A fluke playoff appearance merely delayed the inevitable. Paces like many Bears execs of the past. Just there. His legacy will be as such in Chicago. When are NFL teams going to learn that hiring Bill Belichick's sloppy seconds is usually a recipe for disaster? To find a good assistant of his, you'd have a better shot of winning the Powerball. Joe Judge is just another statistic. Stop me if you've heard this story before. Belichick disciple comes into a new organization and tries to be an over-the-top version of the hoodie in question. He's universally reviled because he's trying way too hard to be authoritative and street tough. Because nothing screams credibility like being a thinner Matt Patricia without the pencil. The shit he threw out onto the field most weeks like a quarterback sneak on a third and nine near his own goddamn end zone shows us that he didn't know what the fuck he was doing. His press conferences reeked of self-entitlement. And this past month revealed what was truly behind the curtain. A fucking hack. How in God's name do you make Ben McAdoo seem like a more appealing option? The jury's found you guilty, Judge. Here comes the executioner. Run when sprints back to Belichick. You can be carried again like every other useless blowhard that was given a chance they didn't deserve. I know he was allowed to retire with dignity, but with how awful his tenure was, he should not be given that luxury. Gettleman's second go-around with the Giants was a recession without end. Perpetual futility in nearly every facet of the job. Horrendous free agent signings, terrible draft picks, bad player development, and an arrogance that permeated the organization. It says something when the best movie made was the one that was the most reviled in trading away OBJ. Everything else he touched turned to shit. It's ironic. Jerry Reese led this team to two Super Bowls and was deservedly fired due to Ben McAdoo without fanfare in the middle of a year. Gettleman only gave a shit about his own image and gets a nice ceremony and a commemorative watch in large soda. This saga and how they overvalue yes men and loyalty is why the Giants are an incompetent shit wreck. Wait, what the fuck? Why would the Dolphins fire Flores? He was doing a good job with them! 
Miami was on the right track, yet they chose to drive themselves off a cliff due to a power struggle. I get they started the year 1-7, and seven, but Flores kept those men motivated enough to rattle off 8 of 9 wins! Were his offenses and coaching staffs unstable? Yes, but that can be fixed with time. Is the situation in Miami so fucked that they think this is the answer? Let's take a look at the Dolphins' problems from the outside looking in. Horrifyingly bad offensive line, piss poor drafting, and a series of baffling offseason personnel decisions. Most of that isn't on the coach. The Dolphins picked the wrong side. The guy to fire was Chris Greer, not Flores. This kind of move is how bad franchises stay bad. And Miami took a culture that was starting to take root and smashed it to bits. They will regret this day. And that regret will come sooner than later. May these coaches find peace in their next home. Or in the football afterlife. Amen. Can be even better taken advantage of. Go Raymond in the backfield. Look at this trickery. Kennedy got a man. Raymond wide open. Now it's a foot race on his way for the touchdown. 